For even sheep do not vomit up their grass and show to the shepherds how much they have eaten. But when they have internally digested the pasture, they produce externally wool and milk. Do you also show not your theorems to the uninstructed, but show the acts which come from their digestion? Discourses of Epictetus. Welcome to the Instinctive Influencers Podcast, a show where influence becomes one of your tools for success. Now, here are your hosts, Brian Weber and Ed Haley. Hi, I'm Brian. And I am Ed. And this is the Instinctive Influencers Podcast. Ed, how are you, my friend? Uh, I'm a little groggy today. It's a rainy Saturday and I've already uh, rode the old exercise bike for 10 miles. Got my little cardio only day, my rest day. Oh, it's not Saturday either. It's Sunday. So that tells you where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. So you feeling you feeling a little uh, rested from that 10 miler? Not, not really, but I might have a nap later. I love naps. So are you saying that on your, on your rest days, you still do an active like recovery is what you're saying? Yeah, at least I do cardio mm, usually seven days. Okay. At least cardio. So yeah, no. And then right now I'm hooked on this Netflix series. And uh, so I go do cardio and then for an hour I watch an episode from Netflix my gym actually got Wi-Fi this week too, so I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Netflix series you're watching? Uh, Making a Murderer. Oh, wow! Yeah, it's it's interesting. <laughs> is it a documentary? It, it it is, and it's pretty. Uh, I mean, it really spans from like 1985 till. Uh, I think I'm at 2014 like fourteen ish, fifteen maybe in the series, and it's basically a guy who does 18 years for something he didn't do, gets out and then sues and gets now he gets accused of murder and you know he's saying hey I didn't do that I was set up by the sheriff's department and he gets convicted and now they're trying to go to trial to try to get things overturned and it's. Yeah, so it's twisty, turny. It's very interesting. It's, it's not a bad series. That's crazy. I'm still trying to figure. I'm trying to finish. Uh, I've got like two episodes left of The Witcher. So I have not I've been started. taking that one slow. I have not started. I really like that. Really good show. I love. I just. I, I, I think I said it last time, but I really like Henry Cavill. So I. I mean, he. I thought he was the perfect Superman, um, and it just. I don't know. Ever since he played Superman, like any other movie he's in, I really like too. So, hmm. or TV show. But also, not sure if you're tracking this. You being a DC fan, much like me, Titan Titans is back on Se- season two. Yeah, season two is out. I downloaded them to my uh, Surface for cardio time as well. So as soon as I finish this other show, that's next. I got it. I've got to do that. I've got to get them downloaded to my my uh, iPad because I'm definitely I start I tried to watch the uh, the first episode last night I fell asleep before the credits were over or started oh no <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no. definitely tired mm. so I, I actually brought up I, I kind of I hit upon uh, what you had said there you, you had mentioned because you know you work out a lot and you do believe you're more of one of the uh, the types who believes in the rest day every once in a while I'm I I don't take a rest, so to speak, but I kind of take it easier on some days. So I guess you could say that's an act of rest, but I think it's our approach to our physical abilities, which we also have an approach to, you know, our mental abilities and things like that. And it's, it's kind of like driven towards the idea of our goals of self-development. Yeah. So it's, it definitely does. And then, you know, so over time and space, uh, I've started like now I, sh- I stretch more. I didn't used to stretch. So I knew I should. And I learned to stretch properly. And now I do a little more stretching as I've gotten, especially as I've gotten older. And then same thing, rest days. Like, you know, I want to go hard every day. But as I've gotten older, I know, okay, you got to back off a day mm-hmm. <laughs> and at least rest. I used to rest Saturday and Sundays, but uh, I'm an apple sheep. So 
I try to keep my streak alive for my um, the little rings thing. Anybody with an iWatch or, or Apple Watch will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I have to do something on Saturday and Sunday yeah. in order to achieve my closing my three rings. Ah, it makes sense. I, I don't have an Apple Watch. I have the, the Garmin deal, but it still makes sense. I mean, it sounds pretty cool. Yeah, and it's just... I, I thought about that because, you know, we had t- we were discussing earlier and you said, you know, I took time off and stuff, but it's, it's really all goal driven, right? We, we're, we're trying to perform in certain areas uh, and, and, and increase our self-development in some manner. Like for instance, I mentioned during our smart goals episode, one of my personal goals is to read more books and I've been forcing myself Instead of when I go to sleep at night, normally, it's like last night was the first night I did not do this. But every other night since uh, the new year, I had been reading Mathis's book, Call Sign Chaos. I read so many pages each night. Excellent book. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very, I mean, I think that's definitely going to be, that probably possibly could be a book for us in the future to uh, kind of hit the high points about. Because even, I mean, just in the first chapter, you, you're just there's so much knowledge there that you're just like wow you know and i mean it's, it's a lot of information in his mindset i do love his mindset on things but it's all the goal of self-development's there and it's taking little chunks off of it you know instead of saying okay i'm gonna read 20 pages every day well what if i don't as long as i read some of it and i'm getting something out of it i think that's kind of what's important yeah i mean we've talked about many times the importance of you know, being a lifelong learner and the importance of reading as a tool for that type of learning. So we've talked about that on the show numerous times. And I know that the former secretary of defense is one of those guys that has a a rather robust library that he uses. So I might have to send him a message and tell him he needs to look into this audible thing because it really makes things a lot easier. Uh, I think about now, you know, with audible, the time driving back and forth to work, you know, that's like 30 minutes of music that now it's 30 minutes of, you know, whatever the latest book is, whatever Harry Potter book I might be on. Or uh, this week I started a book called Positively Unstoppable, The Art of Owning It. Mm. Uh, and it's pretty good. Yeah. By uh, Diamond Dallas Page, the WWE Hall of Famer. Really? DDP Yoga founder. It's it's pretty good. Yeah, and he talks about like goal setting, um, kind of what you were talking about. And as a, you know, hey, I'll, let's be realistic. You're not going to read a hundred pages a night, but let's set a goal. And he talks about being measurable, like we talked about on our smart goals episode. Uh, let's set a goal of reading ten pages a day. So start small and achieve those. Very much like a smart goal, but he calls it uh, SmackDown, and it is an acronym. I just don't remember what all of it stood for. Um, but yeah, so audible has helped me increase my reading, increase my own self-development. And, uh, and I think that, uh, really helping me build some more, uh, knowledge. That's awesome, man. You know, I, and it's funny. So you brought that up and I earlier, I was, I was just sitting there. I was trying to watch, uh, one of the, uh, the playoff games and it was a, uh, there was a commercial that came on and I thought, man, this is a great idea. And it's actually basically, it's called the growth mindset. And it's taking place in, uh, from what I can understand, it's taking place in the Japanese uh, schools. Or basically, you know, the DOD, they're American schools, but they're in Japan, you know, on the basis. And it talks about basically they're teaching the kids this growth mindset of if you fail, then you use that as a learning point to continue to grow. It's, it, you know, it's okay to fail but you shouldn't continue to repeat that. And that's kind of, I mean, if you think about it, they're teaching that at a young age for kids. That's a good idea, I think, because everybody's going to fail at something, you know, and to continue to grow and to learn. I mean, that's just, if you know, I wish somebody would have taught me that when I was younger, I would have probably done a lot more uh, throughout my life and career. So that's one of the big problems I have, Brian, with this whole you know, we talk, we tease it and call it the everybody gets a trophy generation, but that's one of my problems though. So if you give participation trophies, those children growing up don't understand failure Yes, because they still got a trophy, but when they have to watch that other team get trophies and they get nothing, it, it, that's the, that's a failure that they experience young and they learn to cope with. 
So when you give participation trophies, that's just me now. Other people are going to say, oh, no, that's not what it is. From my mindset, I feel like participation trophies, they, it doesn't teach children how to fail. That's just me. I think it's lessons of losing. Lessons of losing is pretty big. You know, you know how many times, Ed, when I was a kid and when we were younger, me and my brother, he used to whoop my butt on video games. And I just, I learned a lesson of losing. Now, my brother also learned a lesson to that, to my losing. Do you know what that was? Don't brag about it or I'll lay the smack down on you. I, you know, I've thrown, I've thrown controllers <laughs> at him before. So he's learned, Hey, listen, don't, don't, don't be gloating. Cause, uh, I will, I will throw this controller at you. So, I mean, you know, we both learned from that and it was a great idea, you know? So, Hey, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> all right. So Ed, you read, um, a small quote from Epictetus, right? And in, in that, it, I, I, I love what it says. It talks about <laughs> the sheep and they don't vomit up the grass they ate to just show the shepherd how much they ate. That falls in line with about uh, pretty much the goal of self-development, knowledge versus wisdom, what we're going to get into today. It's actually uh, it's an article, small article, but it's an article that we, we've, we're going to cover. It's from the Green Notebook. Uh, obviously, that's a great place to find wonderful, wonderful resources. But I thought about that. That very first sentence, I thought about it when it says he doesn't vomit up the grass to show the shepherd how much he ate. Instead, he, he basically just does his job. And goes throughout and makes the wool and, and and milk or whatever. Much like with knowledge, it's not a good idea to I'm um, taking in all this knowledge and then spit it out just to show, oh, I know all this stuff, instead of using that knowledge that you gained to do something and do your job or or to fulfill your roles and responsibilities and stuff like that. That's to me, I thought, man, that's just that's it's the smallest things that make you really contemplate on what's going on around you. Yeah. And you know, Brian, this is uh this has always kind of been my problem and a lot of people's problem with uh, the, the military promotion system and promotion boards, because I can study, I can memorize and I can regurgitate information, but then I can't take that information and put it in action. I can't, I can tell you what the book says about, you know, firing and, and maintaining my assigned weapon, but I can't actually shoot. Like, so mm-hmm. that's that knowledge. Like I, I know, but the wisdom to me is when you put it in action. And I think that's, that's always been one of my problems with the promotion system is you have people, what we call board babies and they can memorize a bunch of great stuff. But then when you're like, Hey, now go be in charge of this range. They're like, uh, I don't, I don't know where to even start. Yeah, it, you just yeah. told the board, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's what I thought of reading this article is kind of the whole military system and regurgitating information, but not understanding what you're regurgitating. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And and uh, I, to tell you the truth, I was uh, I was kind of fascinated with who this Epictetus was. I didn't really know who he was, so then I just started looking him up, trying to find out more information. Um, because like just the things that, you know, sit in that. And then a little bit later on, I'm like, this guy, you know, he's definitely got something going on here. And obviously what people don't know is who he was. He was basically a slave back in about 55 to 135 AD. And he basically a slave who became a a Greek stoic philosopher. Now he, he obviously, he lived during that time frame. He was in the Rome area and then he actually got banished from Rome and then he went out into the, like basically north northwestern Greece for the rest of his life, and that's kind of where he started all his different ideas and, and teachings of philosophy. And his teachings were actually written down and published by his pupil. And, and, and it's called basically one is called Discourses, and another one's called Enchiridion. The thing that kind of caught my eye, and I've heard of this guy before, and, and you you made you mentioned some stuff, and we'll talk about it here in just a second. What caught my eye was is he is an influencer of others. And in that manner, Marcus Aurelius. Now, we haven't personally talked about Marcus Aurelius on this show, but we've heard on other shows, uh, for instance, Jocko's podcast, he's talked about Marcus Aurelius. I think also, I think I've heard uh, Order of Man podcast that he talked about Marcus Aurelius. But 
I didn't, you know, I really didn't know much about him either. Now, what is it that you know happen to know about Marcus Aurelius? So Marcus Aurelius was a he was a Roman emperor. He's actually a very popular uh, Roman emperor, but unfortunately for him, his bloodline after him, his son Commodus, was not as popular. But Marcus Aurelius was a very popular, and in Rome, a lot of times these guys they rise through military, and that's where they gain a lot of their notoriety and things of that nature. I can tell you from being in Rome, there's statues of Marcus Aurelius all over the place. And when you go to the Colosseum as part of the tour, they'll talk about Marcus Aurelius. So, And then his book of meditations is something I've actually heard about on a few different podcasts as well. Uh, and I want to say maybe Jocko, but that's another very popular thing. It's also, if you look at the 2018 and I may be wrong star major to army suggested reading list. I believe the Marcus Aurelius meditations is actually on that recommended reading list. So uh, that's kind of his impact still today. So when we talk influence, now we're talking spanning Mm -hmm. a long, you know, period of time that uh, he has had some kind of influence like, you know, many military generals after him have probably read. And then many generals after him in Rome were probably led by him and he was their example. So just he has a large sphere of influence over time and space. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, here's an example. Uh, I found I was doing this research about Epictetus and he was actually also an influencer to James Stockdale. Now, People might not know who James Stockdale was. Basically, he was uh, he was a 1992 vice presidential candidate for Ross Perot. Uh, but what really shocked me was he was a fighter pilot who was shot down while serving in the Vietnam War. Now, he was introduced to the works of Epictetus basically while he was at Stanford University. Uh, but Stockdale credits Epictetus with helping him endure his seven and a half years in captivity which included torture and four years in solitary confinement. I mean, can you imagine? Basically, when he was shot down, he reportedly saying to himself, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. Basically, the quote that Stockdale uh, concludes in his book, he adds in his book right there, is the emotions of grief, pity, and even affection are well-known disturbers of the soul. Grief is the most offensive. Epictetus considered the suffering of grief an act of evil. It is a willful act going against the will of God to have all men share happiness. Basically, this this particular fighter pilot uh, who, who earned the Medal of Honor, by the way, and he he served seven and a half years in captivity. All right, and you you know if you if you've seen anything dealing with Vietnam, that seven and a half years was not very nice to him. I guarantee it. No, no. I mean, from, from your no. studies, Ed, you, you, you took a whole class uh, for your degree on nothing but the Vietnam War. What is it that you could tell the audience uh, that may not be aware about the Vietnam War and, and being in that, that confinement type that can help them understand? So a lot of stuff that we see depicted in the media, like uh, movies and stuff like that, that, some of that is pretty accurate. Like I've uh, listened to podcasts about Charlie Plum, who is another, uh, Charlie Plum was another guy who was a pilot shot down and maintained in one of these camps where, you know, they they basically uh, wither away. They're fed minimal, usually rice, usually rice full with maggots. They're tortured and beaten um, when you think about the interrogations, like basically, they, I mean, they could be honestly saying, Hey, I have no idea, but that's not what is being looked for. So the beatings continue, the mistreatment continue, the torture, the waterboarding, all that stuff would just continue. And a lot of these guys, uh, when you listen to their stories, they tell stories of, you know, they have to leave their, their body and take their minds somewhere else to survive these uh, horrors that they, that they have inflicted upon them during, you know, captivity in Vietnam. A lot of guys turn to stuff like this. Some guys would just write, uh, I think it was Charlie Plum. Actually, he would write stories from his childhood as he could remember them being told to him. And he would just write them in the dirt or whatever he could just to, to maintain. So, 
these guys mental state and the strength of them mentally to if they survive that kind of stuff that just really speaks volumes to their mental uh strength and, and their resilience and their you know their will to survive so uh, i mean these weren't nice places this isn't you know going to club fed this is like these guys were in cages in the middle of hot jungles minimal food and water so oh absolutely man and that what that did that kind of paints the picture of the idea of how Epictetus had a, a he had like this influence upon him during his captivity and and what it did was is it kind of kind of brings together this idea of basically what we're going to look at just for a brief moment uh today's show of basically the differences between knowledge and wisdom and its application to leaders. And that's where we're going to go with this from, and, and, and you and I know, you and I both know we've known and met a lot of smart military leaders. They can rattle off dates and battles. Uh, they can quote doctrine like their Southern Baptist can quote a scripture. Uh, some even have advanced degrees and have taught in military academies, much like we have. It feels good to appear smart and impress peers, bosses, and subordinates with knowledge, but is it really helpful when they do that? Uh, it's so one of the things I take out of this article, Brian, is uh, those things are great to know, and you need to understand your past to plan for the future. You know, there's things, there's lessons to be learned from the past to make things better now. Mm. But th- so when we talk about knowledge, they, again, they know these things, right? Th- th- they've eaten this grass, mm-hmm. but they they haven't put it into action. They haven't produced the milk or the wool from the from the earlier quote that all they can do is regurgitate these facts. You know what I mean? Like, but can they, so this is something that, you know, general Patton who studied, he was very good at using what he knew about military history before his time and use it when planning his own tactics, when he was planning his own strategy. And and that's where you need to know this. You know, he would say sometimes, well, when the Romans fought, you know, the Germanic tribes, they did da, 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 da. And I think we could also use the woods to our advantage here. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, I'm one of them guys. I, I don't necessarily know key. I don't know dates. I know key battles. And I know a little bit of information about military history. I'm by no means an expert, but right. One of the things that, one of the things that I did and my branch chief never knew is I allow my students to do a double, double and en- uh, envelopment on one of the uh, lanes they were out there training. And basically what they did is they attacked the village or they come up on the village, the village attacks. They got the village uh, bad guys to pull into them while they sent two teams out to the left and right and flanked from behind them Mm. and actually pinched off. (laughs) Not the strategy that we were supposed to be trying to get them to use, but Hey, it's what they came up with. And I was like, Oh, this is cool. Yeah. Because you know, this is something that was used in military history. And I think that's a good example, even though in training, but that soldier, whoever came up with that idea somewhere, he's, he's read that he's understood, Hey, this is a different option to flanking this is a different option to dealing with this uh, contact and he put it into place. So to me, that is now wisdom. He used his knowledge and he used it in a training environment, but he, it becomes wisdom when he actually puts it into place. Absolutely. You know what I mean, yes. And that, and that's exactly what it should be like. That's to me, it's, it's uh, showing that you can take that new found knowledge and you can put it into play. If knowledge is the acclimation and regurgitation of a bunch of information, what we're talking about here, then wisdom is being able to digest and produce like if it is a sheep in that, in that quote earlier. Yeah. For example, it's great when leaders know facts and figures about famous battles or can quote theory, uh, theorists like Clausewitz or Sun Tzu, <laughs> but who cares? I mean, so what? I'd rather have someone who can uh, take that knowledge of those battles along with the lessons from the, from the experiences and apply it to the current situation and then visualize and describe the way they're going to move forward. Now, it's funny because as we were going to go through this, that very thing that I just mentioned, that's exactly how, uh, basically how 
uh, General Mathis, he talks about how he did things. Wisdom is knowing when to push an organization and when to back off. Now, I can speak from personal experience on this, Ed. Uh, I, I know there yeah. when I was a younger Sergeant E5, I did not understand that that basically idea of it, right? I didn't understand the whole, listen, you can't keep running the throttle on these kids 100 miles an hour just because you want to go 100 miles an oh, hour yeah. does not mean they can go there. And I learned, I learned a lesson on that, right? Um, and I learned a lesson the hard way when a soldier all of a sudden lost his mind towards me kind of, and I was like, Whoa, 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 you know, but then I got pulled back a second by a, a senior leader and said, Hey, listen, do you not see what's going on here? You're running them ragged. When you push, 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 you have to know when to let off mm-hmm. the throttle a little bit and understanding that and knowing that, okay, there are times when you push really hard and then there are times you got to back off. I've, I've embraced that over the years. You know, it's, now I may be able to do it myself, but not everybody can handle things the same way, you know. Uh, if you kind of you kind of feel the same way, yeah. So again, you know, today's today's episode we're talking about knowledge and wisdom, and I think you're talking about right there. So whoever that was that told you, hey, you know, can't you see this? You you need to know when to throttle down, right? You now that that to, they they provided you some mentorship and some knowledge, right? That later when you actually do throttle down with your guys and gals right Mm -hmm. you've now displayed the wisdom now you're now you're saying hey look at this pile of wool i got from that knowledge like Mm -hmm. so i i think that you you know you demonstrate it but that's a key part we've done a whole episode talking about mentorships and mentees that's a key part the knowledge comes from that mentorship relationship the wisdom comes from you executing those things in the future on your own Exactly. And, and and to me, that's, it's just understanding that. Here's another one. Wisdom is surrounding yourself with people smarter than you. So you <laughs> can do your job better. Now that to me, that I completely agree with. And I've felt that way for a very long time that if others have capabilities that you don't have, then bring them in. Too many times I've seen where people will push somebody who's smarter or faster or stronger away because they feel like they're a threat. And it's like, no, don't you realize they're going to make you better. Um, I've talked about it before on the show uh, in my particular career field before, you know, before I came a senior leader, when I was a junior leader, people would hoard knowledge. And I'm like, why are you, why do you hoard knowledge? Like I want to be around the smartest people who know how to do this because I may be able to troubleshoot this particular wire issue or, or electrical issue or mechanical issue or whatever, but I may not know this one over here. And if somebody understands that a little bit better than me, then I can learn from them. And then if I understand this over here, then they can learn from me. It's that sharing of information, but understanding that wisdom has to be passed on somehow. It you got to put people. I mean, I you've probably heard the uh, the saying before that like Einstein. He was never really the smartest guy in the room. He just had a bunch of people really, really smart around him, and it made him seem smarter. I mean, really, you think about a general, right? Yes. So you got a general officer, and then the general officer usually has a chief of staff, usually has a deputy, right? These are the ones that are fielding these things. These are the ones he usually has a senior uh, non-commissioned officer, senior sergeant major to advise him. Well, why has he got all those people? He's He's got all the wisdom, right? No, he understands that he can't do all of it. These other people's job is to be smart and help him. That's the whole reason that you have advisors and things of that nature is to help. And then we've talked about many times about ego. And I mean, what you're talking about, Brian, for me to say, hey, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. All right. My soldiers know more than me about each of these individual things. That's we're checking egos again. We're talking about mm-hmm. how important that is. And, and because these things come up so often on the show that, that lets you know that these are real important things. This ego checking uh, is another example. That's important to be able to check your ego as a leader and say, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but help me understand. And then that's when we do course of action development and they say, Hey, now they make me smart so that I can make the right decision. If that's, you know, the situation given it 
uh, at that time, whatever, you know, whatever have you. But so that that's why, you know, it is important to understand. I don't know it all. I need to keep people around me who help me. Uh, you know, think about head coaches in sports. They all have a coaching staff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a football head coach cannot coach all aspects of everything, of every piece of the game. That's why he has an offensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. That's why I have a quarterback's coach, a special teams coach, a defensive coach. It's the same thing in a workplace, though. If you can have those people who this is their area of expertise and then we come together and together we have a winning team. Mm-hmm. And that's 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 success. Yeah. And if, if I could break it down, uh, what you just said, I, I love what you talked about earlier when you say you have the commanding guy, the, the, the commanding general or, or basically the guy who's in charge. He has to kind of know he or she, he or she has to kind of know generalities and, and be able to speak, speak smartly upon things. But he has a administrative slash personnel personnel person has a intel individual. Uh, not just one, but a bunch has has logistics individuals who who uh, branch off into multiple areas of logistics. Has an operations who who dissects the operations of things Absolutely. and provides courses of action. You know, uh, and then a comms area, right? To be able to to be able to make sure all these different communications are there's the capabilities there. You don't see my colonel out there setting up the communications. Of uh, for his for his you know whole operations area. Now, can I say something good and say that yes, I've seen him physically out there putting hands on equipment and helping during setup when he felt like that was the right time to do so and he wasn't over engaged in other things. Yeah, and I respect that because that goes to show that I'm not too good to get after it with everybody else. But he has those peoples who make him more knowledgeable. That's the whole, that's their job. That's what their job is to do is to make him more knowledgeable on the situations and everything about it. So he can make the right decisions. And that's why it's always, always better to surround yourself with people smarter than you. So you can do your job better. I firmly believe on that. I just, it's unbelievable, but Hey, let's get to this next one. This next one. I really like it. Wisdom is not only knowing the difference between right and wrong, it's also knowing yourself good enough so that you avoid the ethical dilemma in the first place. Let me tell you, I've met people with some ethical dilemma in my life, in my career, and their examples has driven me to stay the course on multiple aspects, whether it be in a personal aspect or whether it be professional, just it. You, you see them, if you see them do wrong, most of the time, and, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this too, Ed, most of the time, those who do wrong or go, who, who veer from the, uh, the, the, the right ethics, they get caught. And it's usually like, wow, you know, but it's the wanting of doing right and not, not just doing right. But when you do right, you want to make sure you're doing right by the people around you, not for yourself, but for them. So things will be okay in a sense, but Knowing that, I mean, to be knowing right and wrong and then following the right course, that, that's a big thing. Yeah. So for me, Brian, this this here reads like, you know, I know what's right and wrong and I know how to keep myself out of the situations where I have to make a decision between those. Uh, and, and that's the wisdom piece of it is understanding right and wrong and, mm-hmm. and how to avoid, you know, that scenario. And obviously things happen. You can't always maintain that. Sometimes you get thrusted into a situation where you have no, you know, you have to make a decision of right and wrong. Uh, and then your wisdom helps you make the right decision as well. Uh, which, you know, but it's definitely being able to avoid like seeing that situation. Uh, you know, they talk about the great magic Johnson. They say, Oh, he could see, you know, he can see a play three or four moves before it happens. And it's the same idea with this. I can see that situation coming, you know, three or four actions before. So I can say, okay, well, when I get the three actions before, if I go this way, I can avoid that completely. Don't put myself in a situation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that that's, you know, that's as simple as walking away from a situation where, you know, something could go wrong or, and again, comes through wisdom. So. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I've always taken uh, 
a little bit of personal pride in the statement, such as such, we'll do the hard right instead of the easy wrong. I've, I've always, mm-hmm. I thought that that's, you know, an amazing statement and I try to follow that. So this is, here's, here's what this, uh, the writer has to say now. Here's what I've learned from years of reading, making mistakes in leadership, in staff positions, and a lot of reflection. Knowledge is easy. Wisdom should be the goal of self-development. Wisdom takes a lifetime. It comes from a deliberate investment in your development. It comes from the studying the past. It comes from both success and failure. It comes from taking the time to reflect on experiences until we find the lessons we need to learn. So that right there, it says it comes from deliberate investment in your development. I tell people, and I've said it on here before, I'm making an investment in you. What's my return on investment? I'm making an investment in myself. What's my return on investment on myself? If I'm going to dedicate my time to, to this, how am I going to use that effectively? Am I just reading to read? Or am I reading to become knowledgeable on it so I can utilize it? And that's, that's the wisdom piece. I like this right here, though, Ed. It comes from both success and failure. I think that falls upon what I was talking about earlier with uh, the DOD, U.S. DOD schools in Japan and how they're trying to teach these children the growth mindset of if you fail, then you use that failure as a learning point to grow. That's exactly what that is. Yeah, I mean, at its simplest form, it's if you touch the hot stove and it's hot, you know not to touch it next time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's At its very simplest bear down form, that's what this is to me is saying. I learned because, man, I burned my hand at last time. I see the little red light. I'm not touching that stove. Also, the other thing that this reminds me of is it's an old saying, like, you know, he's a lot older and wiser, mm-hmm. right? Well, yeah, because he has a lot more knowledge. He has a lot more experience. He's been through the rights and the wrongs over time. So, yeah, that's where that wisdom comes when we say, oh, our old, our elderly are a lot wiser. That's why, because this is exactly why. You know, Ed, when you say that, it kind of makes me think about uh, as a being a parent and making this statement, I don't want my children to same, make the same mistakes as me. I don't feel so much uh, the same way about that anymore, you know, because if they don't make some, and, and I don't want to, okay, I don't want them to make some of the bad mistakes I made, but if they, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> but if they choose to make, you know, make a decision on something and it's a mistake, I hope they learn from it. And that, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of like what I was getting from that is, yeah, th- they're going to have to make the mistakes. I mean, there are a lot of small mistakes that I made that, hey, my kids are just going to end up learning a lesson from. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, I can tell them the lessons I learned, but if they don't learn from that, then they're going to make their own. And hopefully they can bounce back from it. Now, the key thing, though, as a parent is to be there for them, to help them through it when they need your help. Yeah, but so tell me this, Brian, so you, to help them through it, right? What are you helping them through it with, though? I th- aren't you helping them through it with the wisdom, just like we're talking about today? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so they're, so really when you say that, you know, your your children are the wool. Let's go back. They're the wool and the milk. Mm -hmm. They're your product of your knowledge developing in the wisdom. Now, when you can share that wisdom with them, now it's their knowledge. Then when they take that wisdom that you've been passed on them and that knowledge now that they've got and they execute those things and then they have some success. Now that's their wisdom and there's the circle, right? Mm -hmm. So that mentorship for you and your children, you're just, you're absolutely talking about my passing on my wisdom which becomes your knowledge and oh, yeah. then your wisdom. Oh, I, so, yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong. I believe in passing on that knowledge and I, uh, that, that is become my wisdom. But if you've never met Eva, I can tell you right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. That she's a hard headed <laughs> yeah. little girl. Let me tell you, she is hard headed. She is very much, and her mother will <laughs> laugh about this as I say it because she knows. And Eva's probably listening because she's in the car when Michelle listens to this. But. She is very much, she is, I'm going to do it my way and no other way. And if you tell her how to do it, it's, it's funny. Just today, no joke, we're there on Messenger and we're conversating and Michelle tells her to do something and Eva totally doesn't do anything, right? 
And I said, why don't you try the opposite effect? Tell her not to. Sure enough, she tells her, <laughs> Eva, uh, you, don't go to your room at all. Or no, 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 no. Just go to your room and don't talk to me for right now. <laughs> sure enough, Eva comes over, hangs all over her mom and doesn't stop talking. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like the total opposite, right? So that's, I guess that's kind of like my idea. Now, Ethan, he's way different. He will kind of listen to you, but if it's not dealing with something electronic, he usually doesn't care. So, well, that's how I think that, uh, that's probably how a fi- family dynamic is. Cause my kids are like that. My son, he has to touch that stove for his own. Even though I just told him, Hey, that light means it's hot. Mm-hmm. He has to touch that stove. Mm. My daughter, on the other hand, a not all the time, but some things she's going to be like, well, dad said the stove's hot. I'm not touching that. Mm-hmm. But then there's other things she'll say, mm, let's see. Maybe it's not like that for me. <laughs> so, I mean, they're experimental, but, but my son, he is absolutely the, Hey son, don't do this. This is why. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I got to try it. So, you know, <laughs> it's funny. You say, so, so it's funny. You say that way with your daughter with Ethan, just the other day, Michelle said, was talking to him and he he's made the comment he says i don't like to go to school i don't want to go but and this was his the the butt in it was but i know it's against the law so i have to go like he, <laughs> he if he knows something's against the law he will not do it he's i don't know i don't know i don't remember the exact circumstance where this happened once but her uh michelle was driving or doing something and oh or she was parked in a spot she wasn't, something like that. And he was literally concerned. He's like, you can't do this. We're going to get arrested. We're, and it was something small, like nothing big at all. And he was literally freaking out because he's like, I, don't, I can't, I don't want to get arrested, you know, that whole type of thing. So the idea of it all is, is whenever Eva goes out to do something, we're just going to send Ethan with her. So he'll just be her little conscience. Oh, them poor kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hey, let's get into this, and this is the basically the final <clears throat> in the the final minutes of the show here, talk, talking about turning knowledge into wisdom. That first one is my, one of my favorites, and and this is when I heard this as a young soldier. This one blew my mind because I was like, "What? Uh, think about the leaders you admire, and then ones you can't stand. Use their examples to improve your own leadership abilities." And you know, as a young leader, and we've talked about. This also numerous times on the show, uh, I just, I I was blown away by this. So watch my bad leaders too and learn from them. That's Mm -hmm. what you want me to do. And then it, oh, what not to do, you know, (laughs) because anything to build your knowledge. And then when I become a leader, I use those things now to improve my wisdom. Those are, those are good tools. They're good tools. I mean, after 21, almost 22 <laughs> long years, I'm like a Frankenstein patchwork of leadership lessons from good and bad leaders over the years now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've, I mean, we've talked about that kind of in, in a certain way, especially when we did the uh, Toxic Influence show. But when <clears throat> we're working on, working on the, uh, the products for the show that's going to be later on this year, dealing with good coming from a tyrant leader, whether they're good or bad. I, I've, I definitely can say that that's like one of those things I feel like I grasped on early. And when I say early, like, as in, I don't really uh, recall like having a leader sorts like in middle school or before that, but from high school on, I remember having those good leaders or seeing others who acted a certain way. And I didn't feel like they were a good enough example, or I didn't, I didn't really care much for them. Uh, or how they treated people or acted, I learned from them. So I, I definitely, I, I have to say that I feel like that one's a really good one. I'm, I'm a pretty big, I'm a pretty big fan of this second one, Brian. Oh, I am too, and that's why I, I definitely want to hit upon it because I feel like this is something that everyone should be able to do, no matter what they are. Now you have to relate it to a certain way, and I'll explain it in just a second. But the second one is read a book or an article about a war or a battle, then go and test out what you learned during the next training exercise. Now, when I say you can use this anywhere, you could take the, that type of information of the, the, the thought process, the mindset of, you know, just earlier you said, you mentioned about how you had students, they changed the tactic of how they were going to attack the enemy and they, they ambushed or basically they flanked them. Well, 
You can do that in the civilian market. If you understand, if you understand tactics enough and understand the idea behind flanking and whatnot, you could take that and say, okay, I've got this competitor that uh, is doing X, Y, and Z, and they're able to outproduce me uh, here, here, and here. Well, if I study tactics and then I study their, what they're doing, I can use those tactics to help me develop a plan to ambush or to flank them and to be able to capitalize upon the new knowledge that I gained. So there's a reason that so many military leaders get out and they write these uh, leadership books and they write them from a business sense. If you read one of our books that we talk about frequently, uh, Extreme Ownership, right? What's he do? Jocko gives a real world combat experience, him and, and Leaf. Then he tells you how it relates to a business practice Right. Yes. And then they talk about like the key factors in it. So he takes this Fallujah fight, this combat, I'm sorry, Mazul. And then he says, boom. And this is how these things work in business because you can tie them together very closely. It's not uh, super difficult, but you study these things. You know, it's crazy. So I mentioned earlier that I'm currently reading the book by Diamond Dallas Page, a WWE guy, right? So this guy was inspired by, he was a nightclub owner, by Lee Iacocca's biography. I mean, you talk about opposite ends of the spectrum, but he took stuff that he read from Lee Iacocca, he brought it into his own life on positivity, and then he, so he didn't start wrestling until he was 35. That's much older. Which is Way older, yeah. So at 35, this nightclub owner who can't read, by the way, wow, listens to Lee Iacocca's book because he, he had a third grade reading level. And now he has DDP yoga. He's a Hall of Famer in wrestling. Uh, super positive guy. He's a little weird when he's too positive, if you ever hear him on a podcast or something. But this is him studying somebody else's war plan and in, in business. and bring it in into his own. And, and I don't know what DDP yoga is worth now, but I imagine it's like worth quite a bit, mm -hmm. but he took Lee Iacocca <laughs> is his influence to be a businessman. And I think that's awesome. I think that's just what we're talking about. Same idea as reading a book on a battle and then taking it and putting it into practice on the, on the training, uh, training ground. That's just amazing, man. So what you tell, well, how about you tell us about that next one then? Oh man, this is, this is a good one. So I, this is a good one for me. Wake up early in the morning and think through areas where you can improve and spend a day working on them. Take a few moments to reflect at night on what you accomplished and what you need to work more on the next day. So to me, this is mindfulness. And we talked to um, Doc Holtz. We talked to Doc Holtz about mindfulness. And I got that the app that was created by vet, the Department of Veteran Affairs and use it. But this is something you can do when you're meditating. You can sit quietly and you can just run through some areas you'd like to improve on. And then you can take the rest of the day to work on them. So that's a good thing about starting them in the morning, right? Uh, now me, I meditate at lunch, but I still have half a day to work on things. The one part of this that I'd like to work on, Brian, to help me with my knowledge and my wisdom and my self-development is that end of day reflection. That's something I don't take the time to do yet, but I can see the value in it because now I can say, okay, well, I identified these areas I wanted to improve on and I did work on them a little bit, but you know, I, I forgot to do this one thing. Maybe I should develop a cue to make me remember that um, or, or whatever. So I, I need to work on the end of day reflection. Uh, I got the meditation stuff down and the, and the mindfulness and the self-awareness just got to work on the other part, but these are great tools to understand your thought processes and develop that knowledge that you have. Oh, you know, why didn't I do this? I know that that would have worked. Well, that's you developing, taking something you know, have knowledge of and trying to make it into something with wisdom. Yeah. It's just, it's amazing, man. Looking at it that way. Uh, I, I can definitely tell you that uh, there've been multiple days where I have taken uh, and just kind of thought about 
what took place during that day or how I reacted to something and whatnot. And you, you tend to, if you think about those things and it's conducting that AAR, like we've talked about and conducting that AAR to kind of reflect upon it and say, okay, what are the good? What's the bad? What, what are we taking from, what am I going to take from this? And then making that commitment of the change that needs to happen or the improvement that needs to happen. I, to me, I think that that's solid advice given by this author. So let's look at this, this last one. Seek out mentors who can point out your blind spots even when it hurts and help you get better. That falls in the lines of knowing that you don't know everything, one, and two, checking the ego. Because if you don't do those, if you don't, if you, if you can realize that, hey, I don't know everything, and then check your ego then you will become better if you can do both those things. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of checking your ego. Uh, and, and I think that's the importance when you do develop a relationship with any kind of a mentor, or even as, you know, you as a mentor, uh, you got to have thick skin. You got to be able to accept the great criticism and the great input with the negative. You know, you have to be able to, Except when I say, you know, and, and you were good at this because I have said things to you before. I'm like, hey, I think you probably could have handled this a little different. Then you'll explain your point of view. I explain mine. But that's important to have that thick skin in a mentor mentee relationship because that's how you can develop yourselves and increase your knowledge, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, if you're sensitive, they're not going to say those things that you really need to work on. Everything's going to be great. You're going to be a one, one or a top block guy all the time because you don't take criticism. So you got to be the best of everything. You know, you uh, know, that's not, that's not helping you. One of the things I noticed too, Ed is those who do not take criticism or do n- will not take advice from others in a sense, they often find themselves alone. Because people are not going to keep once you know once you shut somebody out so many times, you just like well you know he he just keeps shutting me down. I don't want to go to him. And I've mm-hmm. I've even done that myself. Ed, I've even done that where I I want to help somebody. I try to give them advice on maybe something you know maybe they're missing the mark on or whatever, but they don't accept it. Well, after a while, I'm going to stop because I feel like it's just useless. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my, my energy on something, even though I care about it. I want to see, you know, them to progress. I mean, if they don't want to take it, then I could be doing this with somebody else who actually appreciates it. You know, it's kind of, well, you know, you think about the, uh, the old story of Scrooge, right? And Scrooge never noticed anything around him. And he was just so money hungry and he was just kind of a tyrant and whatnot. But it, it didn't take the first the ghost or the second one, it took the third one to finally, you know, break through him because it was fear. Right. <laughs> but you think, I mean, yeah. you think of the first one is just kind of, kind of puts him in this where he can becomes uh, reminiscent of the old days. Then the second one basically kind of shows him how things could would basically how it would be without him there type thing. And then that last one, well, then, no, that's the last one. I think the, the second one, kind of shows him all the stuff that he doesn't know that's going on behind his back and he doesn't realize. And then that last one showing kind of like how things could, would be when he's not there and, 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 you know, basically imminent death and all this stuff. And I think everyone goes through it. And I don't know if you ever went, I know I went through it. And that's why when you said that, Hey, you were really good at this. It's because I finally had to accept the idea of other people's opinion or other people's, um, uh, constructive criticism, it's not going to hurt me if I at least listen to them and possibly try something. You know, it, it's kind of like that. At least I listen to them. At least I try it a little bit. And if it doesn't work, hey, so what? You know, it, yeah. I, I don't know. That's just kind of how I feel about it. What, what about you? Well, you say if it doesn't work, so what? But that's more knowledge gained at the minimum. You know what I mean? Like you can't be afraid to try stuff for fear of failing because then you're holding yourself back and you're, you're stopping your own self-development, which today's episode is all about, you know, we're talking about Mm self-development. You're really stopping that process at that point. Exactly. Yes. And you know, I I really do feel like today's episode can go uh, in concurrence with uh, the smart goals idea because 
what if somebody sat down and they started writing out their SMART goals, right? And then they started looking at it and they just started to try to answer the, the six W's, not the five W's, but try to answer them. And then they couldn't answer some of them or they didn't think it would work after answering some of those questions. Well, how do they know it didn't it won't work? How, how do they know that if they try to do that goal, that it won't work unless they tried it? And it's, it's kind of that, that same idea, you know, it's always good to have somebody in your blind spot. It really, I mean, I really, at times I feel like my wife is my blind spot person. She's there in my blind spot and she's seeing and hearing things a certain way that I don't notice. And she helps me. I feel like you, Ed, you've been multiple times in my blind spot. John Rogers, when he was working, I felt like he was in my blind spot and he held me up. <laughs> it wasn't, it's not like that people just, you know, oh, you know, look down upon you or gossip about you because that's a whole different type of person. Those, those are the type of people I don't respect because they kind of lose leadership capital with me if I know that they're kind of being disrespectful behind my back. But, but those individuals, they're the ones there, they're kind of development. So use that uh, and to help you grow individually. And here's a key thing, Ed, the very last part of what he's having to say here. If you fail, that's okay. You're still investing in your end state, which is wisdom. If you fail, that's okay. Uh, the next time you want to brag about a fact you learned from reading uh, you know, or from school, stop yourself. That's not wisdom. Instead, show someone how you've incorporated your lessons into your daily habits. Uh, we, we sit here all the time, Ed, and we give advice on the show or what we've learned and we're trying to help others learn. But at the same time, I feel like we're doing this through our examples. For instance, you know, we took a lot of what Kevin Cruz had to say. And not only did we just, we didn't just regurgitate. I mean, I know you didn't and I sure didn't. I'm actually trying to do some of the things he said. Now, can you do it all at once? No, you can't. It's, I mean, you know, it takes habit. You got to build habit to do some of this stuff. But to do that and to be able to speak intelligently upon it will help others. So this is something, Brian, you know, you and I joke back and forth about our, our desire or our, not our desire, our preferred means of working out. Right. Yes. But you don't, I don't think that I don't imagine at least that you walk into the gym and say, Hey, I read this. I believe you probably just go in there. Right. You take that knowledge and you execute it. Yes. That's wisdom. You know what I mean? How, yeah, do you and I talk back and forth about stuff? Oh, you know, I, I learned this. But generally when we say, hey, I learned to do this to help improve your deadlift or your whatever, it's usually I tried it and it, it felt pretty good. It's something we've already tried before we share uh, that knowledge with each other. But that's a good example of this. Instead of saying, Hey, I learned that rack pulls can help a deadlift. No, I'm going to go in the gym. I'm going to do rack pulls and I'm going to see if I can feel a difference. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So kind of the same idea instead of saying, Hey, I read this. All right, no, go execute. And, and that would be what I would tell the audience. This is the next thing, you know, going in line with this, the next time you learn something, a new thing, a, something that you can make useful to your team at work, execute it. Don't just tell everybody about it. Go do it. Yeah, that's and that's that's real sound advice because I know we have done that, you and I, Ed. Um, so with that, I want to challenge our listeners to do just that and to learn something and then to go execute that thing that they learned and make it happen. Uh, so today's task is going to fall in kind of in line with they're learning something new here. They're understanding or they're, they're, they're getting a better understanding of the whole self-development and understanding what knowledge is versus wisdom. So today's task is to pass on this show to somebody to help them understand also the difference between knowledge versus wisdom. Pass on the show. Allow somebody else to learn the same thing that you may have learned or to further understand they did today. Um, with that, Ed, I, I, uh, I really enjoyed, uh, getting, to, getting with you again today on, uh, just the small idea of, you know, goals of self-development, knowledge versus wisdom. To me, you don't realize these types of things until you do a little bit of research and then you back it up with executing anything else for the audience before we, uh, we start the, uh, end of the show. Uh, no, I think that, uh, you know, the audience, if they've done stuff like our episode on smart goals, right. 
we provided them with some knowledge on what smart goals were. And then when they go out and do it and then share it, they're executing through their wisdom and showing or demonstrating through their wisdom. Uh, and then hopefully everybody's smart goals are going well. Hopefully uh, whatever it is that they decide they wanted to do, they, they're, they're sticking to it and uh, they're finding some success and building some winning streaks. Oh, that, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Hey, so those of you out there, you've obviously, if, if you're listening to the show, you've listened before and, and you uh, kind of know where to find us. But for those of you who are new to the show, I would say, hey, go to Facebook, check out 101 Influence in your search bar, and that'll take you to our main page. And then if you want to become part of the closed group, which really we, we put the tasks and stuff on that you actually just have to hit visit group, answer the three questions, submit, and pretty much you're in. It's just one of those things where we want to try to involve as many people as possible. But it's good to know how many people are out there that are a part of the entire Instinctive Influencer Nation type thing. Also, if you're curious to see other things that we're uh, involved in or that we're taking care of, Instagram, same thing, 101 Influence. Uh, we try to post things here and there on the Twitter which is also 101 Influence. You just got to type those into the search bar and you'll find us. Um, you can find our website. It's all one word, instinctiveinfluencers.com. And you get to go see our pretty, well, you can see that handsome mug of Ed Haley uh, if you scroll down when you say, when you click on the Meet the Voices tab. Uh, it looks wonderful mm -hmm. with his poodle and his uh, drink. Uh, but check those things out. Share that with others. Just like with the task, you know, don't you, you don't just have to share the show. Maybe share information that you're learning from the show with others because to pass on, yes, it is good to pass on that knowledge, but at least help somebody know where to go to find that knowledge. And this is a good starting point because we offer up tips and points all the time uh, and, and try to point people in the right direction to help them. I mean, that's the point. Uh, lifelong learning, part of lifelong learning is to help others develop. Uh, but with that, I really don't have much more for the audience, Ed. So I am Brian. And I am Ed. And this has been the Instinctive Influences Podcast. Remember, know how to separate knowledge from wisdom. Have a great day.